and thanks so much for coming and attending what I think uh, we think of right now as a very timely conference, and I think by the end of the afternoon, uh, we'll be even more convinced it's a timely conference. Uh, I'm Nelson Cunningham. I'm the president of the American Security Project, uh, just newly elected by my fellow board members, which is a little daunting. Uh, I was a founding member of this organization back in 2005 and 2006. And it might be good to just set the table a little bit for what ASP is, uh, because it was started by John Kerry, uh, who had just lost the presidential, the presidential race. He came out of that deeply concerned by the state of the discussion in America about foreign policy, the extent to which foreign policy had become partisan, the extent to which foreign policy had become a partisan football. And he, of course, was at the epicenter of this, running against a sitting president in, in 2004 when foreign policy was one of the key issues facing the country and facing voters. So he thought he would do something about it, and he did it the old-fashioned way, by bringing people together. He founded ASP with the vision that he would bring together Democrats and Republicans together on a board, together with retired military officers to give us the underlying steel and business people and people in media, but to try to create a forum here in Washington where he could get beyond the partisanship on, on foreign policy issues to discuss what is true, what is key in national security and American national security, and we would turn to our military officers to tell us that. And then the Republicans and the Democrats and the media people and the business people would say, now, now that we know what the military people are telling us we need to do to keep America strong, how do we talk about it in a Washington that is increasingly divided? And it's been that vision of ASP uh, which has kept me engaged for m most of the last nine years with this organization. And it's one that continues to animate Secretary Kerry. Just last week on the margins of the UN Security uh, on the UN General Assembly meetings, he spent an hour and a half with us, our board and some key stakeholders, uh, giving us a tour d'horizon. The fact that he would spend an hour and a half in the middle of one of the busiest period of his year, when he's got 160 leaders, 160 foreign ministers, all tugging at his suit jacket. Uh, and he spent an hour and a half with us, walking us through the challenges that he sees in foreign policy, the challenges that he sees personally um, as our Secretary of State, it was truly remarkable. So his commitment to this organization remains, and that's one of the reasons why you find that the dedicated work on the part of both the board and our terrific staff at putting together programs that we feel are timely, uh, are critical to American security, and that try to raise the bar on how we talk about these issues in a way that makes it politically easy to do the things that we need to do, rather than to get it mired in the sort of dreadful partisan politics that it impacts so much uh, of the work in Washington and in this country. So with having set the table there, let me say it's with real pride that we're here talking about Africa. Uh, uh, ASP is not new to thinking about Africa. We've been thinking about it a long time, in part because our generals and our admirals were telling us long ago that climate change in Africa was going to lead to dreadful problems, that the security needs in Africa were going to lead to problems in which the U.S. military was necessarily going to be involved. And so we've been thinking about ways in which the U.S. relationship with Africa uh, should be promoted, should be couched, should be developed, so that U.S. interests, U.S. security interests, can be integrated with those of Africa in a way that supports both our interests and the interests of Africa. Uh, I don't have to tell you sitting in the room that this is a, this is a new moment for Africa. Uh, it's been a long time since you've seen uh, both the that you've seen the positive signals, broadly speaking, coming out of Africa that we've been seeing. Just in our own focus here, uh, the U.S. Africa Summit which occurred in August, in which, in which I assume many of you were deeply engaged. Uh, a, a historic opportunity to bring the leaders of Africa here under the direction and guidance of President Obama 
his national security team to set the table to talk about things that we thought were Africa should be thinking about. At the core of that, power. At the core of that, infrastructure. Doing the things, helping Africa do the things that they need to do in order to develop their economies and to make themselves more secure and better places for their citizens. Um, for so many years, developments in Africa were driven by resources. The oil companies, the mining companies. I know in my own my own day job, I run a firm called McClarty Associates, and we help companies deal with government and strategic issues around the world. Well, five years ago, we had no Africa practice. Why? Because the oil companies and the mining companies had been in Africa for decades. They knew what they wanted to get out of Africa. They already had made their arrangements with the governments, and they were set. Today, we have four people working full time on Africa. Why? because Walmart cares about Africa, MetLife cares about Africa, Google cares about Africa, Kellogg's cares about Africa, McDonald's cares about Africa, JP Morgan cares about Africa, our broad range of clients, APR Energy cares about Africa, our broad range of clients look at Africa not now as just resource plays, but as consumer markets, as markets that have tens if not hundreds of millions of people who will soon be in the middle class, as you, as you might define it in the developing world, and who are going to be consumers of products that globalized companies sell. So we've seen, in my own day job, I've, I've seen that integration, and I've seen the way that Africa has begun to loom ever larger uh, in the lives of our companies. Now, the trend lines are obviously terrific for Africa, and I won't bore you with statistics, and I think we'll hear a lot of statistics from our panelists all afternoon, but the headlines are dreadful. Ebola, uh, it has to be at the top of the list, the horrendous pictures that we see every day in the newspapers. Um, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab in Kenya. Uh, the issues that are roiling Africa continue to be the same issues that have always roiled Africa. Uh, we could be thankful that at Congo. We could be thankful, though, that some of the things like mass famines aren't happening today. And we can be hopeful that the governments are continuing to increase their capacity to serve their people in more fair, more honest, and more productive ways. Um, the focus for our presentations today, we've got a number of extremely good panels today. Uh, let me just set the table for you. Uh, first, a panel, which I'll be moderating with my colleagues here, and I'll introduce them in a minute. Uh, extending America's national th security through private sector investments. How is the American private sector going to help develop Africa to our benefit? And what are the tools that the US government has to help American companies that are interested in Africa? Second. What are, the, what are those opportunities for investment? Will be our second panel. Third, once you've decided to invest, how in the world do you manage the risk that you find in Africa? Because the risks there are almost unique in the world, coming from all sorts of directions. It's our hope that at the end of, at the, end of the afternoon, uh, you'll come away with a sense of why one would want to invest in Africa, what the tools are, that are available to you at the hands of the US government and others to help uh, you invest in Africa, where the opportunities are, and then how to manage those risks. So with that, let me take off my welcoming hat and put on my moderating hat and introduce the panel for the first segment on encouraging private investment. To my right uh, is Lee Zak, who to a lot of people in this room really needs no introduction because uh, she is the head of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, which is one of the smallest but most efficient and effective agencies that the U.S. government has when it comes to leveraging federal dollars to helping, to helping American companies invest abroad. Uh, my first real introduction to TDA came in November of 2008 when I was uh, part of then President-elect Obama's transition team. I headed the transition for Exim, OPIC, and TDA, three extremely fine agencies. Uh, and my introduction to Lee Zak came then because she was the deputy director at that time, a 
career employee. She'd been the career general counsel, career deputy director. Uh, one of my tasks heading the transition for these agencies was to think about who the new head might be for the agencies under, under the new president. And I came back from my meeting at TDA and said, I think we have our new head. <laughs> And it's our acting head. <laughs> and I was very pleased that the, uh, that the president's team picked up on that suggestion and that Lizak um, uh, was nominated by President Obama and is the head of TDA. And she'll walk us through the ways in which TDA is working with the private sector here. To her right, uh, Ambassador Robert Jackson, who is the principal deputy assistant secretary of state for Africa. For those of you who know the structure, the way the State Department works, the PDAS is the one who actually does all the work. <laughs> uh, but he, he, and he comes to this with a rich background. He was ambassador in Cameroon. He was chargé in Morocco. He was chargé in, uh, in Ghana. Uh, and he's had postings all over uh, Africa, as well as serving as desk officer for critical countries uh, here, in, uh, here in, in the State Department. So Ambassador Jackson, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, to be able to know what it is the State Department and how you view the region, how you view investment opportunities, and what you're doing to help the private sector support you and our national security interests. To his right is Scott Eisner from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Scott himself has a terrific background in Africa, which I'm referring to right now. Um, he. Uh, he has worked closely with Tom Donahue, who was the very strong leader for the chamber. Scott knows how to uh, pull the levers at the chamber to attract both the chamber's attention and industry's attention on whatever he is focusing on. Uh, his focus now here uh, on Africa, I think, tells us a good deal about where Tom Donahue's thinking is and where he needs to be leading his companies and preparing the way for his companies as they look around the world. So, from the government, from the private sector, I think we have a terrific panel here uh, to help us walk through the first topic. Uh, our, our program here will be very simple. Each of our panelists will spend five minutes or so teeing up what they have to say, setting the table for their remarks, and then we'll have a moderated discussion which will take us through to about, uh, all to about 1.45, so roughly an hour and then we'll move on to the next panels. So with that, Lisa. Thank you very much, Nelson. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I have to congratulate you on your new appointment. And I especially want to thank you for being the head of our transition team. Uh, and it's interesting, you very nicely set the tone, I think, for this conversation, but also for USTDA's role. Clearly, with respect to security, we know that economic growth is an extremely important part of ensuring security. But the other part of that is being able, and I think it very much goes to the American Security Project's mission, in bringing people together. And that's exactly what USTDA does. USTDA's mission brings the US private sector to play a role in infrastructure projects in emerging markets around the world. <coughs> and we do this in a couple ways. One, and it's something that I definitely want to talk more about and want to leave time for questions and answers and a real discussion. But one of the things that we have heard about with respect to economic development and being able to move on and taking advantage today of some of the financing that's available, especially in Africa, is that there really needs to be project planning. That there are ideas, but they're not necessarily ready for the financing stage. What USTDA does is that we provide grant funding to help with that early project planning. So it can be feasibility studies, technical assistance, or even pilot projects, demonstrations of US technology in place. The other thing we do is we focus on building partnerships. And we bring delegations to the US to meet with US businesses. We think this is important because one, it's very important not only to focus on some of the large companies, but also the smaller companies. And what this does is it allows us to bring delegations to the US, not just Washington, DC, but throughout the country to be able to meet with businesses of all sizes. 
this has become extremely important with respect to Power Africa. And we were having a chat um, before we sat down here today. And USTDA has doubled its portfolio in energy in Africa in the last year. Major part of this is the fact that the US government is working together as a whole of government approach to meeting the goals of Power Africa. I was fortunate enough to be in Tanzania with the president when he announced Power Africa. And the theme that came through time and time again is that there the, that in Africa, it's a new way of doing business. It's a focus on trade, not aid. It's a focus on partnership, mutual benefit. And that's exactly what USTDA is focused on. So there's a new paradigm with respect to, to development today. It's in bringing the private sector. It's in doing it in partnership. Another example of that with respect to Power Africa and with respect to the recent summit that Nelson mentioned, and I know we'll talk more about that, but as part of that summit, the White House asked USTDA to sponsor reverse trade missions or bring delegates outside of Washington. So we brought a delegation to Houston and we brought a delegation to Chicago. That the belief was it was extremely important for delegates to meet with the American people, not just the American politicians, but the American people. And I think that's extremely important to the topic that we have here today, how this is part of our security. And those were extremely successful events. And as a matter of fact, we had the Minister of Power from Tanzania, and we, who we brought to Houston. And next week, he brought his president to Houston. So, and basically was telling us, we want to follow up on that technology. So in addition, the agency not only makes these connections, but we're really effective. And so for every dollar we program, we're now seeing $73 in U.S. exports. And what that does is mutual benefit. It's also helping the taxpayer get behind this idea of economic development abroad and how it is that it's helpful to them. And one last thing that I just wanted to mention, and I'm going to take it out of the Power Africa context because U.S. Today is involved in um, infrastructure generally, including transportation. But it goes to the topic that we're discussing today. Um, USTDA provided grant funding for an airport in Ghana. That project is moving forward. And as a matter of fact, I visited uh, about a, six weeks ago on one of my visits to Ghana. But when we were there and looking at what they've done to be able to move forward with respect to that airport development, which is really important to their economy, they turned to us and said, could you fund a study for security in this airport? Because we don't have Boko Haram here, but we do have neighbors. And we're very concerned that we could be a gateway and not really know it. And very similar, frankly, you all, I happen to be from Massachusetts and very sensitive with respect to you know, the hijacking at 9-11. Those hijackers came from Maine and got on the plane and transitioned through Boston. So they didn't get, go through security in Boston, they went through security in Maine. And so this is what they're pointing to, is that they want to be sure that they're secure, that they provide it for the security. So not only are we providing for the economic growth that will create security, but more and more people are coming to us to help with respect to the actual security in their countries. So you know, all of these are challenges, but these challenges also bring opportunity. And I have never seen a time where there is so much opportunity, so much response from the US business community, and response from the African community, because I think we're listening. We're listening to what they want, and it's focused on trade. It's capacity building, it's economic development, and it's working together in partnership, which ties right back to the American Security Project and I'm delighted to be here and look forward to our questions. So do I have a good eye for talent or <laughs> Ambassador Jackson. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm too pleased to be here for an interesting and timely and provocative topic. Promoting a more stable and economically prosperous Africa is very much a U.S. national security interest. And we're seeing some encouraging trends in spite of the headlines. Africa is home to most of the 
fastest growing economies in the world. We see a burgeoning middle class. And we see a lot of economic successes. Um, yes, there are security challenges in places like Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan itself, Nigeria. But overall, the democratic processes in Africa, while not always perfect, have been improving over the past two and a half decades. And, of course, U.S. companies want stability and security when they invest. Those investments, in turn, provide security. Private investment creates jobs, bringing technology and management best practices, and it strengthens global interconnections. And these investments create wealth and prosperity both here in the United States and in the countries that are the hosts. Our national security goals in Africa are broad. They include strengthening democratic institutions, promoting trade and investment, ending conflict and fighting extremism, and all forms of trafficking. They also encompass eliminating extreme poverty, combating disease, and climate change. Our approach is to promote development of Africa's human capital which is very different from the Chinese approach, and perhaps we could talk about that more. Um, but Africans themselves have to take the lead in tackling the continent's challenge and in seizing the opportunities. Our role is to support them in that effort. The U.S. private sector has played an important role in enhancing our broad national security goals in Africa. For example, government, civil society, and private companies are working together to implement the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010, to break the links between illicit minerals trade and abusive soldiers and armed gangs. Thus, we're reducing conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Ebola, let's talk about Ebola. Ebola is very hard to get, first of all, in case you don't know that. And I want to be very clear about that. Um, but the way the United States is responding to Ebola has been very vigorous. And President Obama has determined that responding to Ebola is a national security priority. This is a global crisis that demands a global response. And we're using all the tools of American power, military, diplomatic, health, academia, as well as financial support and know-how from our private sector, bringing all these together in partnership in order to help the people of West Africa to tackle this crisis. The private sector has a vital role to play. A group of private companies operating in West Africa is already organizing in-kind and financial support. And those companies have committed to stay in the region. Other U.S. businesses are also looking at ways to contribute. The private sector's commitment to remain in Africa and to help rebuild the economies affected by Ebola after it subsides, and it will subside, will be key to the region's recovery and thus to U.S. national security goals in the region. In the longer term, promoting economic development driven in large part by private sector investment is critical to our national security. The U.S. Africa Leaders Summit featured the role of private companies. That focus on trade and investment set the summit apart from the summits that China, Japan, the EU and France hold uh, with Africa. We announced $33 billion in commitments for new trade and investment on the margins of the summit. This included $7 billion in new financing to promote U.S. exports to and investments in Africa under the Doing Business in Africa campaign. Underpinning this business development and growth must be expanded access to electricity Lee talked about that, but let me mention just a couple figures. So the new level of investment assistance for Power Africa is $300 million now. And this new goal is to permit 60 million households and businesses to be connected to electricity going forward. With $6 billion in new private sector commitments, the total commitments under Power Africa now exceed $20 billion. And the theme of the summit, investing in the next generation, reminds us that one of the most important and effective ways to, promote, to prevent 
conflict in the future is to stimulate economic growth and unlock opportunities for the next generation. That's why we created Feed the Future and the new alliance for food security and nutrition, which are leveraging public funds to mobilize billions in private investment to enhance food security in Africa. That's why President Obama expanded his Young African Leaders Initiative, which provides resources for entrepreneurs to further support leadership development, entrepreneurship, and to connect these young leaders with one another and with Americans. Our overarching national security goal on the continent is to help Africa reach its potential. We want to be good partners, and as highlighted in the Leaders' Summit, this is a task for all of us, government, civil society, and the private sector. You can help build the roads, the power plants, the mines, farms, factories, and provide the services and products that Africa needs for sustainable growth. This, in turn, will help prevent security and health challenges in the future. And I hope that we can work together to find new ways to promote African prosperity. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Ambassador Jackson. I said he was Georgia in Ghana. It was Senegal. My apologies. Uh, Scott Eisner, tell us how the Chamber is looking at Africa and why Tom Donahue put one of his top people in charge of the African Bureau. Sure. Well, thanks to you and to the ASB for organizing today's event. I think it's a timely topic, especially as you dovetail economics into security, because I think they're uh, hand in glove, or fist in glove, if you will. As we look at it, it's hard to follow up to such esteemed people that I work with, because they always say the good things. So you look with all the uh, with all the makeup stuff along the way. But I think the chamber, you know, Nelson, you put it well. The chamber is putting its full force behind our activities in Africa. We've had a strong program over the years in places like China. Uh, throughout Asia, Southeast Asia, throughout Latin America, and, and kind of like uh, McLarty, it wasn't until about seven years ago I was Tom's chief of staff and I had lived in Malawi and I turned to him one day after sitting and listening to I think Hank Greenberg or someone talk about Africa and said, why are we doing anything here? And so that was the point he said, well, we are, you are, tomorrow. <laughs> go do something, get away from me. And so well, Donahue, it, you had to watch out with Donahue because if you suggest something, uh, you'll be doing it next. Yeah, <laughs> and so I learned that hard lesson about seven years ago. Uh, about what we would be doing in Africa. And that's really where we sit today, is six years on, I think we've seen a tremendous upswing on the continent. Um, Chamber, as you know, is probably up to about three million companies all told. Uh, part of our program, we've got folks like General Jones giving us advice on the security side of the equation and how that dovetails in the economics. And then we've got folks like Ambassador Don Gibbs, former ambassador to, to South Africa, has been in government on a number of levels and has a deep private sector experience helping us. We're home to the U.S. South Africa Business Council. We're really engaged quite deeply with the government there, trying to help them think through what a, a encouraging investment climate looks like, not to be protectionist. It's a difficult task. I'm actually headed there on Saturday to meet with Minister Davies and others uh, around uh, U.S. Africa policy and how we can move the regional efforts ahead. I think we can talk a little bit about how regionalization is going to help expand the markets. Um, that's all to say what we're goal of the chamber here is, is really the level of playing field. Uh, you touched a little bit, Rob, on China. I think that's our biggest challenge, and I've heard this from leaders across the continent, is we don't have colonial ties to the continent. We don't understand uh, how tribalism works, how different societies work within these countries that were divided amongst uh, resource terms, not actual boundaries that they decided upon. I think that's a challenge when American businesses come to look at the continent. You talk to many leaders uh, who are here for the summit, you know, maybe they've been to two or three uh, countries. You. So, uh, Chevron has probably been to Angola and to Nigeria. Take Jeff Inland out of the equation and you probably have uh, a few folks who have traveled as far and as vastly through the continent. So really what we're, we're our, our program that I designed is really to get to the heart of it. It's the policy and regulatory functions of governments, both in the U.S. and in Africa, that we're really trying to structure in a way that does level that playing field. So rather than China coming up and saying we'll do a commodities exchange for a road, how do we get GE to build a factory in South Africa that draws parts from the U.S., creates jobs on our side of the equation, gives skills development to the Africans, and then it has a market for their disposal. Same with board in South Africa, but you could look across the border. Uh, you mentioned APR Energy, a company that comes in and does fast track energy solutions. So rather than waiting 30 years for government to figure out how to do Power Africa, you can get a company to come in in 30, 60, 90 days, not to be a salesman for that company, but they can develop a, a sustainable power supply so you get the industrialization that Africa is so hungry for. We can move towards power, but until those skills are built, um, it's really going to be a challenge to draw that American attention. I think 
about six years ago, we did a, a report at the chamber called Behind Closed Doors, where we went out and interviewed some 30 or 40 top CEOs and C-suite executives around their challenges of Africa. It's still available on our website somewhere. Uh, and their number one issue was skills and education. There was such a dearth of skills uh, and a lacking in education uh, amongst all the countries that they were interested in investing in, Angola, Ghana, you know, uh, Cote d'Ivoire is coming back on the radar. But they didn't know where to turn. I think that is, is really where the, the business community and the security question as we move towards that part of the discussion really dovetail. I mean, as I sit back and look at the continent, I was asked a question last year as I was speaking in a similar form in Phoenix by a historic military veteran. His only question about an hour long presentation was on security in Africa. And how was it that we allowed Boko Haram and uh, AQAP and everyone else to spread throughout the continent? So the problem is that it's, it's not the government's role to figure out how to stem the tide of that necessarily, uh, our government necessarily. It's really the business community's concern because those folks on a whole are not looking to scramble towards the next jihadist movement. They're not scrambling to look for it. They're looking for a job. They're looking for some clothes on their backs, some shoes on their feet, and some sense that they belong. I think that's really where, as we drive our American policy forward, both looking at the military component of it, and the security component, and the economic component, is how do we drive towards a skills development sector, both by American job creation, uh, giving governments the wherewithal to create policies that uh, foster foreign direct investment, don't push it away. Uh, that would include some governments changing their localization policies, the way that they are engaging with China, the way they're engaging with the Indians, and having a more holistic view of how do they approach the continent. So really, I think at the end of this, conversation looking at how does skills replace militarism in the continent is going to be the key uh, and I think as we as a government and a business community work together in a private public partnership how do we build the skills factories of Africa to build factories of Africa and I think that's really where I sit back and look at where companies are going so I'll end on that note because I think question and answer is much more entertaining than my monotone voice. Yeah, no Scott that was a really terrific and extremely broad gauge uh, approach to development, economic development in Africa. So, so thank you for that. You know, six years ago, the people who got most excited about Africa uh, was the development community, which is essential. It's important. Remains important. In my experience today, the ones who are most excited about Africa, uh, because they have to be, are both the private sector, private companies, uh, and also the the U.S. military, because they understand that some of the newest challenges. American security are going to be coming out uh, of that part of the world. Uh, Ambassador Jackson, you're the one here who was probably best able to talk a bit about the, the military threats that can come out of Africa. But perhaps on the more positive side, you can talk about AFRICOM and sort of how uh, we're looking to integrate uh, our military services with the unique environments that Africa, that Africa presents. Well, what I'll say is that uh, with deference to General Hamm, who may also have strong ah, views on that. If, if he's here, here I hadn't seen him, sir. Well, I hope that uh, maybe we'll pass the microphone to you. Uh, <laughs> I like being on this side of the yeah. room. <laughs> no, but after, uh, after Ambassador Jackson, if you, if you wouldn't mind, sir, I'd love to be able to have you answer that question. Um, so Africa Command has been very successful in responding to a variety of threats, and I think that the way we are deploying the military across the continent has been very much in line with a new approach to Africa. Um, it is not a militarized approach. It is very much in combination with Department of State and its efforts. Um, but the US military has a unique role to play in helping countries like Nigeria to improve their capacity to respond to Boko Haram. Similarly, Niger and Mali to respond to uh, AQIM. Uh, we're working uh, with a variety of uh, African militaries across the continent to respond to both terrorism and to crises like the one in the Central African Republic where we've just seen a complete breakdown in governance and order. And African Command has really stepped up. Um, their response to the Ebola crisis has been terrific. We're setting up um, air bridges between Senegal and Liberia, between Senegal and Ghana. Um, these will be vital to our response to the Ebola uh, crisis going forward. And, and the U.S. military has 
taken on these roles that no one else has wanted or been able to play. And that's where I think AFRICOM uh, has shown its great success in being nimble, in being able to work uh, in direct response to what the different crises have presented us with. Well, one of the advantages of having an organization that does have broad relationships across Washington uh, is that we are able to ask our our fellow board members for military officers to extend our reach. So we are delighted to have General Hamm here. And I, I really hope if we can count on you just for a minute or two, General, the former commander of AFRICOM, uh, retired four-star general. Perhaps if you wouldn't mind spending just a, a couple of minutes addressing this same issue, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Nelson, and Ambassador Great to see you again. I, I do very much like being on this side. You look good in a tie. Tell me. <laughs> it's, it's a different tie. Uh, um, but I, I think Ambassador Jackson uh, characterized it properly. I, I think that part of it is the, 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 the maturation of the U.S. military engagement across the African continent. We were just talking with some, some new friends here about uh, the U.S. military does not have a long history of engagement uh, throughout the African continent, and so it was, a, it was a pretty steep learning curve for us. And I think we are, we are now, uh, under John Rodriguez's uh, leadership at, at AFRICOM, at a point where, uh, where, where African civilian and military leaders understand more thoroughly what AFRICOM is, and, and importantly, what it is not. Uh, and I think uh, the partnership that has developed over many years between uh, Africa Command, uh, the Africa Bureau, and Aries Affairs, who has handles Northern Africa, is stronger perhaps than it, it has ever been. Um, much like the U.S. government's role in the, in the private sector and in business development, AFRICOM does not seek to, to, uh, uh, to, to lead these efforts, but rather to listen first uh, to African partners and find ways in which the U.S. military can bring to bear its capabilities in, in ways that are helpful to host nations. Always coordinated through the through the uh, U.S. ambassador. There's not this. Some people have this sense that that I was bouncing around the continent of Africa doing whatever I pleased. But, <laughs> but I always but I always recognized that wherever I was in whatever African country, I was never ever the senior American in that country. It was an ambassador, and so we coordinated our efforts there. So I think what we're seeing now, in, 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 uh, I think Nelson's right, in the, on the, now in the aftermath of the African Leaders Summit, uh, the bonds uh, are between the United States and the African countries, the regional economic communities, the African Union, are growing stronger and stronger. And that's certainly true in the, in the military domain as well. Uh, and I think it's very helpful. Uh, what AFRICOM seeks to do is to help Africans provide uh, or to develop African security capabilities so that they are increasingly capable of providing for their own security and contributing to regional security. That's clearly in their best interest. It's in the best interest of business uh, development, but it's also in the security and best security interests of the United States. So a very collaborative, cooperative effort is what the command seeks, and, and I think we're starting to see that uh, that play out. So thanks, also. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you all. Well, thanks. Thanks for agreeing to uh, <clears throat> volunteer to, <laughs> to join our conversation, General. We really appreciate it. Um, I failed in the most important job of the host, which is to thank the fathers of the feast. And so I'd like to thank uh, Dante Desparte with the Clements Group and uh, Fadi El Salamin with YCF, a private investment firm based here in Washington, for co-sponsoring. Uh, our program today for providing the lunch, for providing the rest of the infrastructure for this. You'll be seeing each of them uh, on the next panel, and you'll understand why it's nice to not only have them helping support a venture like this, but then putting their brains and their intellectual capital to work also. So thank you both, and uh, thanks for this. to do that for people's memories of lunch or too far, <laughs> too far in the past. So thank you. Thanks again. Uh, let me ask one more question, and we'll, then we'll, of course, open it up for about the next 30 minutes. Uh, China. Um, should we properly view China as competitors in Africa, or should we view them as complementary uh, 
uh, economic participants in Africa. You know, you can think of of a China as uh, uh, you, know, you can think of them as providing, you know, capital, labor, infrastructure, fast infrastructure. They can throw things up faster than anybody can. Uh, they obviously have an interest in controlling some of the markets, some of the resources there. You know, what the U.S. brings to the table is very different. Sure, we can, sure, we're very interested in infrastructure, but the infrastructure we're going to build is going to necessarily be very different. It's going to be much more expensive. It's going to be slower. It might be better quality. It might be more enduring. It might be more, in, it might be more integrated with the broader economic and environmental goals which these countries need to do. But it's going to be of a different nature. Uh, we can provide education resources that Chinese can. We can provide skills training that they can. Uh, let me ask Lee Zak how TDA, how often you see the Chinese, and you, how do you view them as competitors, as or as uh, complementary uh, economic players? I think the answer to that is yes and yes. Ah. That uh, I think clearly we see China as competitors to U.S. business. That you know one of the things that and I, I enjoyed what Scott had to say. Um, one of the things we have to do is level the playing field. And what we're hearing from many of the folks in the host country is, yes, China came in, they built things quickly, they're now falling apart, um, they have left their labor behind, that's creating problems for job creation in their country, but they were cheaper. What can we do about it? And as a result, USTDA responded to that request by developing a global procurement initiative working with host countries to basically put forward the principle that you actually can look and value something over time. And that is your better investment. And that with respect to developing infrastructure and certain projects that you can have the private sector participate in and fund, then you want to level that playing field. You want to get the best quality. You want to be able to have U.S. have an opportunity to participate. There may be other times with respect to development assistance that yes, we want China to step up with development assistance, not just building infrastructure. And so I think it can you can complement in that way, but I do think that really China is a competitor from what we hear to many US businesses. And what we have to do is basically show what the value is over time, where you want to get the private sector involved, and where there might be places. For China to be able to play, where there really isn't a role for the private sector, where they should step up as a donor, as the U.S. for years has stepped up as a donor. That's fine. Yeah, just want to jump on that. I think the answer is exactly that. yes to both sides of the equation. I mean, there are many a company who partner with Chinese companies in different parts of the of the continent. We either partners directly, or we're watching them build a road so we can build something else alongside of it because we're not out there building a road. But you know, the concerns around the China element are, are justified, and I think over years you've seen them evolve in their value quotient on the continent, as I've talked to folks both in the private and within the government structures, that, you know, five years ago it was China coming in, swapping out, you know, copper or what have you for a road, a hospital, or a bridge. Uh, if that price went down, well, they left it by the wayside because, hey, what the hell do we need that for now? we got enough copper anyways. Um, and then they left behind prisoners that they probably brought over, workers, and I think that still <laughs> exists, but it doesn't exist any longer. And I think I'm using this as an exploratory as an example of how the China model has evolved so much over even a short period of time, five years, when at one point it was purely uh, neo-colonialism, if you want, to now where it's true investments in markets. I have fears around that investment because I think the U.S. has a small window to actually engage effectively from a private sector standpoint. We saw a procurement contract in South Africa recently for locomotives get split between GE and the Chinese company. The Chinese company doesn't deliver a good product, I'll tell you, every day of the week as the, as the GEs of the world, yet the government was inclined to split the product. Now, I don't think China's going to deliver those goods at the end of the day. It'll be an opportunity for a GE or an EMD locomotive from Caterpillar or some of those people to step into the fray. But that's to say, over a short period of time, I think the Chinese, like the Japanese in the 70s, when they delivered a pretty crappy product to the US and to the globe, they're going to figure out how to deliver a much better product. And that's where my fear comes in, is five, 10 years down the road, they're going to engineer some better product or an equal product to what we have and still be able to slow, sell it at a lower rate. And they'll figure out what customer service actually means, which they don't have right now. 
And I think that's the real fear to my security. And then on top of that, you talk to the folks like the General Jones, and just think of the systems and the backbones that are being put in place by the Huawei's of the world, the GTZs, and not to touch on the Snowden issues, but who has access to that information at the end of the day, and who is going to have that portal should disaster strikes? And my fear is that we're not going to have that portal unless we can figure out a way to encourage and incentivize our companies to get much more engaged on the company. Ambassador Jackson, anything to add on China? Um, I want to pick up on something that you said, Nelson, and that is that the kinds of projects that we're competing for are not the same. So in that sense, I don't think there's direct competition. Um, and I agree with Lee that, that China should be doing more development. But what sets us apart from the Chinese competitors um, is the technology transfer. And the fact that Africans don't like seeing all of that Chinese labor. Um, and we need to work to emphasize both of those things. Let's throw it uh, open to the audience. I've got some other questions to keep things going, but I suspect we'll get better questions coming out of the audience. There's a microphone here. Uh, raise your hand if you'd like to engage in the conversation. And the only thing I'll ask you is that you uh, identify who you are, uh, where you're based, and then actually ask a question. Yes, sir, right there. Caleb Morrow, Vulcan Natural Resources. I'm based in, I'm based in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but our company operates in Ghana. Um, specifically, my question regards exactly what we talked about the Chinese regarding projects, more large at scale infrastructure, not small scale infrastructure. In our experiences in bidding projects in Ghana as a locally owned company, we have lost out to Cinepec and others because it's not the price that's the main issue, it's how the government or the private entity pays for the project over time. Because they're willing to commit to pay, they just typically don't find favorable terms from U.S. companies as we've seen. What are some things that USTDA could do, Chamber of Commerce could do to help swing that pendulum back in the U.S.'s favor? I think that's one of the things USTDA is doing with U.S. businesses is one, to provide project planning on a grant basis. So that is one of the things we can do as you sort of look at it. The other thing that USTDA has done, especially in a competitive bidding environment, is that USTDA has indicated if you choose this US company, we will provide X dollars in training to go with it. So in that way, it also sort of affects their cost um, with respect to training to zero. And then we can assist in those projects. So we recognize the concerns um, and we try to provide that assistance to be able to help US companies. I agree with what you're saying. I think the challenge with whether it's the Ghanaian or it's an NCC procurement project is this, this idea that you're taking a, a cheaper thing. And I think the way that, that Rob and Lee have such a great platform to talk about is this life, the, the long value of an American investment, that it's not just for a day or a week or until that boat is coated with peanut butter, until that you know next rain comes and washes it away. It's the, it's the fact that there is training, there's skills development, there is a social responsibility element. And I think that is where the American private sector can explain their story, but the government's always gonna look at it and say, what's the best interest of Vulcan in this case? What are they really getting at? But if you could bolster it with you know, a State Department or others through the uh, advocacy center saying, well, you guys gotta look at the lifeline of this project and how many jobs will be created by the Americans and the fact that they won't be leaving behind X. And that's the way I need to, I think we need to explain it. I think that's part of the challenges around some of the FCC procurement when I hear from companies saying, American <coughs> companies saying they lost out to French, German, Chinese, even even if they're not state-owned enterprises any longer, is that there's not this consideration about the lifeline of the project and the quality, um, and how do you factor that into some of these bids? It's, I think, something we all need to work on. And I think we also have to encourage um, some pressure on the Chinese to join the same international organizations that we're bound by. I mean, part of the reason yeah. they can do that financing is they're not part of the OECD as you know, we are, and so Exxon Bank has certain rules, as do other, uh, other countries. So I think that's the other thing, is we have to start putting pressure on China to step up and take their place and play by the same rules. And as far as Exxon Bank is concerned, its largest portfolio is now in Africa. Big change from just five years ago. On the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, uh, has an office in South Africa and has created two more on the continent, one in Central Africa and one in West Africa. 
you know, focusing on both OPIC and Exit, and then we'll go back to the questions. You know, OPIC's head, Elizabeth Littlefield, uh, is a banker who then spent time at the World Bank, is somebody who both knows finance and who knows development, is passionate about it. So her commitment to Africa is really deep and really genuine. And in Fred Hochberg, you know, one of the great salesmen, uh, you know, his, his mother is Lillian, uh, Lillian Vernon, the great uh, catalog uh, company. And so he learned how to sell stuff from his mother, and he himself is a terrific salesman, as we all know. Uh, my brilliant memo to the president-elect back in November of 2008 said, well, Exxon has such a solid congressional base that they'll never have a problem. No. <laughs> it really did. It really did. I said, OPIC is what we have to worry about. But as it turns out, OPIC is doing just fine in that regard. And XM, astonishingly, uh, finds itself in the crosshairs of a very odd uh, confluence of um, a dynamic up on the hill. And I think there probably isn't a person in the room who wouldn't do everything they could to try to help persuade the Congress to extend XM past the middle of next year so that they can support what we're doing in Africa and they can support jobs here in the US. Uh, very few things that you'll find the AFL-CIO and the Chamber of Commerce both, both enthusiastically pushing, and Exxon is one. Uh, and I just want to add the comment about um, South Africa and the office. We were delighted to have OPEC join our office um, in South Africa to, to create the Green Energy Development Finance Center. And we include Exxon Bank virtually um, and hope someday we'll have them physically there as well. Um, so we have a one-stop shop. Good. Uh, Yes, ma'am, right there. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Sedira. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on violence and conflicts, and I'm also a business person. Thank you to see you all. I want to thank the president for the wonderful historic uh, US Africa Summit, which I was part of as a civil society. It was great, and my focus to the president and executive summary was on peace and security. And I'm so happy that we are talking about it now because without peace and security in Africa, there can never be growth, there can never be development. So this is the most uh, subject I think of when I think of African Summit. So thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. So um, uh, what I wanted to ask was, how do we move on with this following the African Summit on trade as businesses go to Africa, China, everybody is now in Africa. How do we collaborate now with the African leaders or African government and the businesses to make a, a peace and security a priority of uh, the continent, looking at investments in African businesses? And uh, the other thing is, uh, as an organization, we are uh, working privately to help Ebola by contributing humanitarian products to take to Liberia. And you know, there are no flights going there, there are no shipping going there, apart from the military, the African, which is working. So I have written a letter which I'll share with you on email if I have your business cards. I was requesting if the military, now that is going there, if it could help us get some of the humanitarian to, um, to Liberia, like, uh, you know, clothes, the sanitation, and other things. Because there are no flights, and that, so there are that no flights. Sounds like, that sounds like an yes. excellent idea. Yes, so thank uh, you. we want your help, and thank you so much for this wonderful event. Good. You know, I might, I might pitch this uh, question also to Ambassador Jackson. What is the follow-up to the Africa Summit? What are the mechanisms that, that you, the department, are looking to set in place to both advance the goals of the leaders and then to continue to engage the private sector? in this uh, collaborative task? So the biggest thing that we've taken on is uh, enhancing the doing business in Africa uh, criteria, but I'm sure Lee can, can add to this. But there are two initiatives on the peace and security side that I want people to be aware of. One is around security governance that focused primarily on West Africa plus Kenya and, and Tunisia, um, because we recognize that in order for business to be able to invest and be certain of uh, fair treatment. You have to have rule of law. Uh, and so we're working in six countries with this initiative on rule of law programs and to make certain that uh, the justice system in particular functions as well as other security institutions. Secondly, um, the vice president just hosted uh, last Friday in New York a worldwide meeting on peacekeeping. The focus was very much on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and 
we are investing up to $110 million a year now over and above our contributions to the UN peacekeeping budget to help six African countries uh, bolster their ability to be able to respond quickly to crises around the continent. And again, there's a real nexus here between uh, investment and security. But I, I'm sure Lee can talk more about economic follow-up. And also practical follow-up. I think one of the things that's really important is we have to keep the momentum moving forward. And as a matter of fact, this week we have a, we we're hosting a delegation from Malawi focused on energy. And we had a business briefing here in DC and they're going to be traveling to Atlanta and to Florida. And the very important thing about this is this is, again, an activity that's focused on not just USTDA, but the whole of government. Um, as you may know, the MCC has provided a second compact to Malawi. And so USTDA was sure to bring the delegation here to the United States. So there's money available. There are projects they want to do. And so we want to connect those two to be sure that US businesses have an opportunity to do that. We also have another delegation coming in a month focusing on aviation, which is regional from Africa. So I think one of the most important things is we have to keep those personal relationships going. We have to build on the momentum. And so we've been hosting reverse trade missions. The other thing is you know, the ambassadors here from, from the Africa are really excited and want to move forward with respect to this. So as a matter of fact, our general counsel, who happened to be born in Nigeria, was invited by the government of Tanzania to speak on the diaspora panel. So that's the other part of this, is staying in contact um, with the embassies and working very closely with the African embassies here in the United States. And I'm going to ask for one more thing, in case I don't get a chance, um, which is I think we all need to do our part um, with respect to this to change the headlines, to talk about the successes, to talk about where what has coming next. And um, my team will fall over because I am inept when it comes to any kind of technology. Um, but social media is really important. And we can, we can tweet about this. We can get the word out from this event and other events that things are happening. Um, and to get the word out, not just about Ebola, but to get the word out about the positive things that are coming out from the summit. Scott, on follow-up, any from the chamber? Yeah, I mean, our follow-up is our continued, we hosted about 13 heads of state, some 30-odd ministers, and our, our follow-up has really been on a much more of a policy angle, and so everyone we met with during that time, we had hosted the heads of the EAC, we had Moroccan ministers, and for us, it's, you know, how do we get them to live up to the ideas that they set forth at the summit? Who's holding them accountable on the on the investment side of the equation? Government can do what government wants, and, and they do it very well, but it's going to be the private sector that's going to determine some of the future investment opportunities. And so our engagement has been pretty strategic in you know, what is South Africa doing with their recent security bill, or how is Morocco dealing with taxation of the pharmaceutical industry? And so how do we get down to the nitty-gritty and the functional elements of investment in policy and regulatory environment? And the one thing I'd ask, you know, every administration that I can think of, for the last, well, not every, but the last three will say, had a legacy issue dealing somewhat with the climate. So I'd say Bill Clinton had a go, which is obviously a point of discussion now through next September, and hopefully beyond that, uh, and hopefully just we can get it off the table in the lame duck session be done with a go renewal. Um, you know, President Bush then had pet forests, is a bit of a legacy, and, you know, is still revered despite what public view around the world maybe is one of the guys who really did a lot for the continent uh, and MCC was left. So the thing I'd ask our government is to figure out how do you institutionalize some of these programs that have been set forth and how do you actually put the money behind them? How does Congress fund these unfunded mandates? And I think without that, I'm not sure what the legacy of President Obama will be on the continent other than having hosted the leader summit because as the next person comes in, man or woman is going to have their next thing. We had economic statecraft under Secretary Clinton I haven't heard too much about economic statecraft in the last months, but I don't think that's a fault of Secretary uh, Kerry, but everyone's going to have their new project, and you have to institutionalize it in government and fund it to make it permanent. How do we do that around Africa? It's going to be my legacy question from the summit. Is what is that institution or body look like? Can I just answer that very quickly? Please. So I think the Young African Leaders Initiative, which is investing in um, people, is going to be the president's signature initiative for Africa. Okay. 
Here. Yeah, and, and I would push back just slightly on one thing, having just been with Secretary Kerry last week. Uh, he puts economics at the very top of the tools that he has available. I would say the moniker economics yeah. day crowd. Well. <laughs> We've moved on to the jobs agenda. There we go. That was my point, is that everyone yeah. comes up with a new... They do. They do. Um, it, the woman here in the, with the red necklace, and we'll come to the gentleman here in the second row. Good afternoon. My name is Evelyn Suarez. I'm with the Suarez Firm, and I'm a, a trade lawyer. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank Scott for mentioning a GOA renewal. Um, but uh, my question has to do with soft infrastructure. You all um, mentioned about, you all talked about opportunities. Obviously, there's been a lot of um, reports and you know economic reports about all the opportunities in, in African nations with economic growth and growing middle classes, et cetera. Talked a little bit about challenges with Chinese competition. But um, often companies, and I tend to counsel them uh, into, in, in sticky situations, um, they address, uh, they um, encounter uh, issues with customs and also with corruption. Uh, uh, with corruption at customs and otherwise. Um, what, um, we, we know that the WTO has a trade facilitation agreement, which is a bit stymied by the Indians, but uh, we I need, tend- We need to get to a question. Yeah. Okay, the question is, uh, what, what are you all, do, uh, you know, your, your different uh, business, the government, uh, doing on a trade facilitation to help these countries build, you know, to improve their customs and also to address the demand side of corruption. Thank you. Okay, so on trade facilitation, I think the best example of what we're doing is the um, Trade Africa project in the East African uh, community. It involves working with customs, it involves addressing tariff and non-tariff barriers, uh, and if this is successful, we'll extend it to the other economic communities uh, in the different sub-regions. And in terms of corruption, we've got a variety of ongoing uh, programs in conjunction with the World Bank and different uh, anti-corruption institutions in, in different countries. Um, but the Department of Justice has been uh, very quick to provide uh, attorneys to work in different countries that are open to our cooperation. And I think in a number of countries we've seen some successes and that we've still got a tremendous amount of work to do. No question about it. But one of the things that I saw in Cameroon that I think is a, a best practice and is in being looked at elsewhere is that we're helping the customs uh, to be computerized. When I arrived in Cameroon, everything was still being done on paper. Of course there are opportunities for corruption, but as you computerize things and people uh, have access to the data, they are able to review the data, that it's much more difficult to uh, be corrupt and not be caught. Unless you're a Russian hacker. <laughs> um, and, and this was a very nice segue because we work with our sister agencies um, as they're doing the capacity building with USAID and FCC. But there are technology aspects that can help with respect to corruption. And we, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, with respect to customs, banking, etc. And we're getting many requests to help do the planning and also to introduce people to companies that can help them with the technology that can help combat corruption. Good. We've got a little over five minutes left. Everybody who wants to ask a question, raise their hands and we'll try to shut in a few. This gentleman here, the woman there, and the gentleman here. Why don't we do all three of those questions in a row, and then I'll ask our panel to sort of pick the one that they want to answer. Yes, sir. I want to the read of the Reed Company is an international public company. Sir, could you hold that a little yeah, closer? Yes, the Reed Company is an international public relations company. We've worked most in Asia in the past, we're now working in Africa. Uh, my question is a bit off subject, it relates to African wildlife, wildlife management. The, uh, uh, it's a very basic issue there. We're losing elements for poaching at huge levels every day. Uh, Ambassador Jackson mentioned the Chinese labor there. Uh, Chinese labor, a bunch, bunch of Chinese labor is directly involved in the poaching activities as part of a very vicious chain that runs uh, from, and very profitable chain that runs from uh, Africa all the way to China when you're making, you're killing elephants and making ivory chopsticks. Uh, yes. The, uh, my question is, 
whether there are any of these programs you're mentioning now that reach out to this level of the African community, really do something about it. There's a lot of lip service that's been paid to it. There's a level of concern that's up about here. The United States has an opportunity now to really take the lead and do something about this. It's a difficult project. The only thing I've seen from my experience is we're actually doing this AFRICOM. And there, I know that there's a Marine detachment, for example, currently working in Gabon, mm -hmm. where they are yeah, the elves are really in danger. Yeah. And they are training people there to help yeah. them start that. That's an excellent uh, issue. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Uh, we'll get our three questions in right there. That... Go ahead, please. It should be on. I'm June. No? I'm June D, and I work for the State Department and I'm in the Office of Science and Technology Cooperation. My question is, um, has there been any discussions regarding trilateral cooperation with um, China to do capacity building and economic development? Interesting question. And the gentleman here with the, uh, yes sir. Jack Warner, located here at DC, affiliated with American National Standards Institute, and I just returned from Burkina Faso and working with IRENA. The uh, question is, uh, I appreciate your interest in talking about reliability and performance of products and also capacity building and looking at possibly how training is being done for individuals. But what are you all looking to do in terms of really having to institutionalize this whole area of international standards and you know in both product side and on the personnel side to ensure the countries have access to the standards and using the standards to make sure the products are going to be reliable and perform and that individuals are being trained properly to carry out the work that needs to be done, you know, in terms of the field. Good. Three very good and diverse questions to end our panel with. Why don't we start with Scott, and we'll walk down to Lee, and then we'll go to Pat. Scott. Sure, I'm going to avoid the middle one because I don't have much to add on that one. On the wildlife front, this is an issue that actually is impacting American businesses because it's uh, much like the drug trade is destabilizing a lot of these markets where we're interested. In. So, you know, what we're doing, I, I can't say is, is cohesive in its nature, but we have had a lot of liaison with the State Department and other uh, military uh, entities around the continent about how does the private sector play into, you know, whether it's a motor roller solutions, updating uh, the radio solutions, uh, quick responder networks, how do you update uh, uh, companies and looking at the supply chains and where are those products flowing and how do you secure ports and get back to the trade facilitation custom front. So that's where we're engaged on the Poaching front, obviously, we want to do more, but it's a it's an issue that I think needs really in, internal African government led to really stamp out, and you know it's going to cost some lives and some other things of some very bad poachers. But killing an elephant, I don't feel so bad about that. Um, on the other side of the question, I, I think you're exactly right on the standardization front. This is an issue we ra raised with uh, Chairwoman Zuma, the AU, that this is probably one of the aside from trade facilitation. Uh, know, in customs, I think this is one of the biggest issues that's going to stymie a lot of growth, uh, quick growth in Africa is that every market is going to have a different standard and whether it's a Chinese standard of rail, a gauge of rail, or a Brazilian standard uh, in the aeronautic space or the radio transmissions or it's the American standards, until there is some sensibility around what markets are going to have standards, uh, even in the Power Africa space around power purchasing agreements. It, it's going to be a big stumbling block, and you see that left hand, right hand drive where, and you saw this around Agoa and capacity building. If you want to talk about that a little bit, or Rob, or Lee, that the reason Agoa hasn't been as successful as it could be, and I don't think it's really been that successful, is the fact that we basically gave a Porsche when folks were just trying to figure out how to drive the, the, the <laughs> trolley down the road, um, and that there's no capacity built into that amount of standards of what the products that the U.S. market can accept, and I think that's been one of the biggest challenges. Yeah, very substantive. Ambassador Jackson. Okay, let me start with the wildlife trafficking issue. Um, the president did create a, a task force last year because he felt so strongly about this issue. Since then, we've created two wildlife enforcement networks, one for Central Africa and one for Southern Africa. We've been ver working very closely with customs uh, in countries like Togo, which have um, very few elephants of its own, um, but you have some huge seizures of ivory to, to control the trade. We've also been working on demand reduction with the Chinese because that's got to be part of the equation. And um, we are doing training not only 
uh, with the Gabonese, but with Cameroonians and many other countries through African Command. And USAID is providing uh, financing for additional efforts, especially in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, and trilateral cooperation with the Chinese on capacity building. Uh, we've certainly had lots of discussions with them. Uh, we are working with them in Liberia, for example. We've got uh, concrete cooperation there uh, in the health sector. And this preceded uh, the Ebola uh, crisis. Where that's been sort of our workshop on how we can work with the Chinese uh, more broadly on capacity building. And last but not least, on the international standards, uh, FDA, uh, U.S. Customs, and a few other institutions have been working very closely with, with a variety of African governments on uh, common standards, and we will continue to develop those efforts. And I'm just going to quickly respond to one in three. Um, one, with respect to um, trafficking, I was just in China for the Strategic and Economic Dialogue with Kathy Novelli, Under Secretary of State, who was actually there to work with the Chinese and develop partnerships um, with famous people in China uh, to combat trafficking. And I know this is something that's really important to her and that she's working very hard at. And with respect to standards, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And it's something that USTDA has done around the world and focusing on standards and working with the private sector, NEMA, a couple of the other associations. And I know it's something my team is bringing forward. Um, we're just finishing our fiscal year. As I was saying before, we left projects on the table because we didn't have funding for them. Um, so hopefully they'll be bringing this one forward and we'll be able to fund it in the future. Uh, we're gonna do a little quick change here. I'm gonna welcome my friend uh, Peter Coharis, who's gonna lead uh, the next panel on investment opportunities. But before we do that, why don't we all thank our panelists for a really terrific success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.